Добрый день. Спасибо большое, профессор Солендрович. Dear friends, it's a great pleasure. It's not my first visit here in the Burdenko, and I have a great esteem of the work you do here. So it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to, to contribute to, to this uh, meeting. Today, along with the, some insights on neuromonitoring, I will present also some images on uh, Palazzo Barberini in Rome. So this is the nicest part of the lecture, but the content uh, will be hopefully interesting too. I have no conflict of interest. You know, when, when we start talking about monitoring and spending money, it should be clear if I'm pushing for some uh, special products or not. I'm not, you know, I'm not pushing. This is Palazzo Barberini. The uh, initial um, brainstorming on uh, uh, intraoperative monitoring was, was reported by a group from Harvard University in 1986 uh, with, John, oh, with John Acorn part of the board, and these were the uh, initial requirements, you know, presence of anesthesiologist in the operating room, very important also today. Then continuous ventilation circulation monitoring, including blood pressure, breathing system connection, an oxygen analyzer, and temperature, body temperature. We will see that all of these points are very important nowadays too. Uh, I will go through several uh, intraoperative monitoring devices, including neuromonitoring itself, but also a few concepts on uh, hemodynamic, ventilation, glycemia, temperature and information overload concepts. So these are the, the, the topics of my uh, lecture. Since the main title of this uh, conference is on neuromonitoring, after the, the section on neuromonitoring, you will have a take home message, then I will go through these points uh, rapidly. This is a very important information, you know, from a analysis in more than 600,000 cases in the United States, it came out that uh, qualified centers, centers that are at high uh, case load level, have a significant lower mor mortality in patients with no comorbidity. So younger patients with not associated mor morbidity dies almost half in qualified centers. So there is something that we can do. If we intend to be among those qualified centers, our patients will do better. When we talk about neuromonitoring, this is a, 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 an original view of the Palazzo Barberini. There are several uh, techniques we can consider. Evoked potentials, EEG, Professor uh, Valero will talk more about EEG later on today, BIS, NIRS, intracranial uh, pressure, and microdialysis. Let's see what do we know about these techniques. Again, these are all the techniques uh, suitable for neuromonitoring and neuroanesthesia. We know that evoked potential are established uh, support for improving the outcome, both after brain and spine surgery and vascular surgery. So this we know got to be done and we have to continue to do it. Uh, evoked potential also allows to improve, uh, to reduce perioperative morbidity, but also to improve long-term uh, mor uh, morbidity since the uh, surgical procedures can be accomplished to a wider extent. Now, moving to EEG, um, we know that uh, EEG uh, run bar suppression might be harmful, and especially when EEG bar suppression associated with arterial hypotension, this is a gr predictive of higher increased, eventually, iatrogenic induced mortality. So when we use EEG, we should use uh, also to avoid bar suppression. 
um, bispectral index. Bispectral index has been uh, widely and strongly supported over the years, but still, the clinical advantage we have in using bispectral index monitoring during uh, surgery, I would say, is quite limited. The advantage in terms of uh, um, reducing time of extubation is less than a minute. So, of course, if you give too much of anesthetics, it's too much. And eventually, this might be useful to learn. But then, once your you know, learning curve uh, is established, the, the, the uh, actual, the clinical benefits, despite these numbers might be uh, significant, is limited, few minutes. Cerebral oximetry. Cerebral oximetry has been debated, and there are a lot of studies on this. We also have run a review on this, and the proven benefits are not clear. So, might be useful, might have some room in research, but if should I say that there is a clear clinical benefit not yet proven? Again, this is also true for uh, near infrared spectroscopy. In uh, um, procedural, both uh, um, neuroradiological and neurosurgical, even though we went through uh, a detailed systematic review and analysis of all, of, of all the uh, studies on the topic, grade of evidence is very poor this is the summary of the studies that we reviewed, and the conclusions are very weak. So there is no proven benefit for near, near infrared spectroscopy. No recommended detect cerebral hypoxia. Intracranial pressure, we all know that especially intraoperatively and during the procedure have very high heterogeneity of data and the impact on uh, clinical outcome is limited. Cerebral microdialysis. This is certainly a, a, an interesting tool for research, but no impact in the clinical practice. So we know that the best way after a neurosurgical procedure is neurological evaluation. And for the, this is still true. And for this reason, some authors have considered awake craniotomy the, the gold standard, to be the gold standard. And this might be one of the monitoring techniques that can allow us to improve the um, monitoring. So the take home message for the first part for the neuromonitoring section is that intraoperative evocate potential have an established role in a neurosurgical procedure, beast monitoring, near-infrared spectroscopy, and um, cerebral microdialysis have potentially research uh, roles, research uh, um, impact, but no proven clinical benefit as intraoperative, also intracranial pressure monitoring. The only established way to monitor the neurological status is a clinical evaluation. Can we do something else besides neuromonitoring? ECG, blood pressure, central venous pressure, invasive cardiac output, which one of these can be really useful? We know that ECG in the intraoperative, intraprocedural setting is limited to uh, disturbance of the rhythm and the perioperative management of acute uh, life-threatening uh, arrhythmias in the uh, neurosurgical setting can be even controversial. I, I mean, I'm not sure that having a, a craniotomy patient and DC, a, 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 a V-fib, ventricular fibrillation can be the best uh, approach, but we know that pre procedural mm, new onset of atrial fibrillation is a predictor of increased mortality, you see? So ECG can provide us some important information, and we should prevent 
the concomitant cause for a possible uh, atrial fibrillation. Central venous pressure during uh, neurosurgery, not really useful. Mean arterial pressure, this is important. Uh, I, I know, I've been here and I know how much of attention you pay to hemodynamic management. We know that to, to allow mean arterial pressure to drop below 55 in normal patients, this threshold level is higher in chronic arterial hypertensive patients, is associated to acute kidney injury and increased risk for myocardial infarction. So keep this threshold level as the minimum acceptable for, for uh, patients with uh, not associated arterial hypertension. This was also subsequently proven as increased risk of um, hypotension, again, with a similar uh, threshold level associated with increased 30-day mortality. So arterial hypertension is important, and we knew it also because specifically in neurosurgery, increased blood pressure is associated to higher rate of postoperative complications. So not too high, not too low. Pulmonary artery catheterization, I don't know if you do it here, no. Not, no benefit, you know. You certainly induce a, an associated risk, but you have no proven benefit. We should know that when we measure uh, arterial blood pressure with uh, pedidial artery, the uh, values are higher than if we measure more proximal, and so to uh, correct our decision accordingly. You might have known these uh, studies in uh, spine pressure uh, patient, spine, uh, spine surgery patient. Lactate levels, this is interesting. Lactate levels is, uh, um, of course, a, a, a measure of uh, peripheral perfusion mismatch, but in uh, neurosurgical patients, the increase in lactate might not be as predictive as in other surgery. This is the case of a uh, uh, large meningioma patient that had, you know, a, a, a significant increase in uh, lactate, intraoperative lactates, with no cardiovascular complication afterwards. What is interesting, this is a written study, very recent study, lactate increase, perioperative lactate increase might be associated, might predict worse neurological outcome. So this is an index potentially relevant for us. What about ventilation? Pulse oximetry and arterial partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide pressure. We know pulse oximetry is very important and is a monitor, early monitor of uh, um, desaturation of the reduced content of oxygen. We should also know that too much of oxygen is bad for the brain. You know, I know that here you play much attention to avoid hyperoxia. This is meaningful. Hyperoxia, what happened? Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Is negative both in uh, uh, stroke patients and here, as is proven, in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. Both with the higher rate of uh, um, delayed cerebral ischemia and lower functional status. So hyperoxia is bad, hypoxia is very bad. Arterial carbon dioxide is important, there, there is a relationship between expired carbon dioxide pressure and arterial uh, pressure of PaCO2. Capnography traces are important, especially important in patients with neuronal injury, and we know that hyperventilation with hypocapnia is bad, bad for brain with an acute brain damage, you know both because of a higher incidence of worse 
neurological outcome and higher mortality. So again, like blood pressure, like oxygen, not too much, not too little. Eventually, to allow some levels of hypercapnia might induce a, an increase in, in cerebral perfusion. Glycemia management. This is a huge study we have run uh, with uh, Yale University. Increased blood glucose concentration above 180 in uh, the uh, periprocedural period is associated with a significant fourfold higher risk for uh, infections at one week. So this is a predictor. It means that it should be monitored is another way to prevent morbidity in your patients, not only neurological, but also, you know, general. Temperature. We have been told, we know that uh, uh, hypothermia might be predictive of increased um, bleeding. This, this is a study in, um, in about 1,000 patients. So maintaining preoperative normothermia is important. This is not necessarily proven in neurosurgery, but what uh, hypothermia might show is that there are confounding factors. So lengthy procedure, reduced attention to normothermia, and so on. The last point, information overload. When we address preoperative monitoring, we should be conscious about the fact that too much of information is not necessarily good. So we have to select which monitoring approach are meaningful, what we can learn from this specific information, and how to use those information. Otherwise, if we have 25 numbers and we don't know which one can lead to which uh, relevant outcome, we would go worse. These are few data on uh, uh, information overload. Uh, information overload might be associated with delayed diagnosis, might be associated with a decline in decision quality, and also a, a, a excessive noise, including you know listening to music, speak loudly in the operating room, room is bad for the communication efficacy. So in conclusion, attentive and proactive presence during the surgical procedure is a significant criteria of quality for anesthesia and perioperative monitoring. Neuromonitoring, we know there are established evidence on evoked potentials, not too much evidence on other uh, monitoring and neuromonitoring approaches. Hemodynamic and ventilation, we know it's very important. It's very important to reduce morbidity and mortality. And the criteria is not too much, not too little. We have to be uh, confident with the threshold levels and keep our uh, patient within those threshold levels, you know. Uh, arterial partial pressure above 150 is bad, below 70 is bad. So keep in mind on what you're heading to. Intraoperative hyperglycemia is a, is a pre proven predictor of uh, uh, morbidity, namely increased um, infection rate in the first week, postoperative week. Body core temperature might be the, the, the sign of a lengthy procedure and reduced uh, attention in the preoperative. And please pay much of attention to the information overload. We got to know what we are looking and which information we are collecting is important. Thank you for your attention. Question will, question will be late. У нас есть э, время для того, чтобы э, задать вопросы и высказать мнение. Пожалуйста, коллеги, у Один вас вопрос, есть да. уникальная возможность Нет. задать вопрос профессору есть Белота. Вопрос. Вопросы есть? Сан Саныч, да. Спасибо большое за вашу хорошую лекцию. 
I have a very simple question concerning the microdialysis. You said that it's uh, a means only for the scientific uh, purpose, Research. but nothing for clinical usage. Could you stress again? Because there are so many speculation about this uh, method. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Alessandrevich, I'm sure that over time in your experience you came close to several uh, you know, magic ballot devices. You know, in the last 30 years we have SVJO2. You remember, certainly, we have, you have been using it. You know, this would have been the key tool to save life, to save brain. And then now we barely don't use it anymore. And then especially neuro is the, is the field of magic ballot. You know, we, we have this tool will uh, ease your uh, life and save your patients. I'm not saying that uh, uh, microdialysis is useless. I'm, I cannot say that. Uh, I'm saying that until there is a proven benefit of a certain monitoring device, we should consider this approach a research tool. It means that we are trying to learn more. This is beneficial. Doesn't necessarily link to a better outcome for the patient. We learn. We use the patient to be better doctor and to do better in the future, but on the individual patients, we don't know. We know, for instance, that to have an intracranial catheter carries a risk of infections, meningitis. And this might be the cause that eventually, you know, for this individual patient uh, means a price to pay. And so uh, when you don't know which specific information a tool can provide, we should consider it, you know, a research device, interesting, but not to be implemented in the, in the everyday clinical practice. I'm not saying it's useless. I'm not saying that that won't provide in future relevant information, but as long as there is no proven benefit in terms of what I call the heavy end point, Heavy end point are infections, are functional outcome, are mortality. So no, no impact on these end points, no impact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. давайте договоримся так. Мы в России, давайте задавать вопрос по-русски. У лекторов есть перевод. Пожалуйста, еще вопросы. Young people, come on. Но у меня не вопрос, у меня скорее нек некоторые суждения. Да, но я хотел бы сказать э, защиту э, и микродиализа и э, защиту церебральной аксиметрии. Э, Федерико как-то так э, скептически к ним отнесся, но есть ситуации, э, в которых эти методы нейромониторинга могут оказаться полезными. Была представлена какое-то время тому назад работа профессором Петриковым из Института Склифосовского по микродиализу. Очень интересные данные, где было показано, что между высоким уровнем глюкозы в крови и содержанием глюкозы в ткани мозга, в том числе в пораженном полушарии, в общем-то, довольно большие различия. И когда мы начинаем активно бороться с гипергликемией системной, мы можем прийти к ситуации выраженной гипогликемии в мозговом веществе. И здесь без тканевого микродиализа, мне кажется, очень сложно найти верный путь. Что касается церебральной аксиметрии, но в настоящее время... Доказано, что если у вас значения церебрального оксиметра во время операции были стабильными, то вероятность того, что какие-то ишемические инциденты разовьются во время операции и в после операции, у вашего пациента минимальна. Поэтому отрицательное прогностическое значение этого метода все-таки есть. И последнее, что мне показалось важным. Федерико указал, что глубокая анестезия повреждает мозг. Это, мне кажется, одно из величайших 
один из величайших моментов, осознание которого, в общем-то, является нашим достижением. Единственное, Федерико, у него было указано там на слайде, что снижение артериального давления, которое неизбежно возникает при глубокой анестезии, ответственно за это. Мне кажется, нет. Несколько лет назад я перевел для нашего журнала «Анестезиология и реанимация» замечательный обзор профессора Джеймса Коттерла, который так и назывался «Хрупкий мозг». И там как раз обосновывается то, что повреждающий эффект глубокой анестезии, он связан не только с гемодинамическими вещами. Вообще мозг – это очень сложный такой пазл, который мы собираем в течение жизни. И вот излишне глубокая анестезии, в особенности Барт Сепрешен, конечно, могут привести к тому, что этот пазл рассыпется, и не факт, что он соберется вновь. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. No, there is no question, so that no, I, no think question. That, I think that your comment is excellent. We have to learn how to navigate through different seas, you know? Sometimes it's quiet, but then you have something that suddenly happens, and sometimes it's rough, but you go through nicely. So to know which is the the route we want to keep is important, and uh, too much of numbers won't help us if we don't know where we want to go, you know? It's not the numbers that will say that we are heading, you know, on the right way. So I'm, I want to be, I want to send out this message that when you don't know what you want to do, it's not your monitor that will help you. You got to know it before. <laughs> Хорошо. Uh, Thank you for your you. attention.